Today we will be talking about poetic literature. But uh, we're glad you're all here today and uh, hopefully today will be a blessing to you. Uh, welcome to our studio electives and let's go ahead and open in prayer and then we'll get started. Gracious Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, for your everlasting love for us and for Jesus. Pray you would teach us about your love, teach us about your truth. Help us to know who you are, Father. And may you give us all wisdom today. May you teach us today from your word and give me the words to say also as I try to do my best to explain interpreting poetic literature from your word. So Lord, give us insight and I pray for those who may still be on their way and of course for a safe trip as we return home later today. So we commit our day to you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, welcome to the Zion's Hope Studio Electives. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Michael Weiss. I uh, work, of course, at Zion's Hope as a videographer, editor, and social media manager. And of course, I do some of the teaching too, by God's grace. And I've been doing a series on hermeneutics. I know that's a fancy word. It just means basic Bible interpretation. That's what it's referring to. Principles for that. And while the Bible does interpret itself, we need to use the minds that God has given to us to think about what Scripture says, what it means, to learn what the writer of Scripture meant when he originally wrote it to the audience to whom he wrote it to. And that takes time. That takes time. Of course, it's all inspired by God, and today is part four. Part four. We've looked at some basics already, uh, given some specifics about historic narrative and wisdom literature, and today, we're coming to interpreting poetic literature in Scripture. Poetic literature in Scripture. Now, there is actually poetry all throughout the Bible. Most people don't think about that, but there is. But as always, the primary principles of interpretation are context and grammar. Always look at the context. The verse you're reading and look at before and after. Look at the chapter, look at the book you're studying, then compare it with the rest of the Bible. Then look at the words and phrases that are used within that chapter, within that, those verses too. Because these things give meaning to the text. Because as we all know, even in English, we can have one word that means like seven different things depending upon how it's used. That's why English is so difficult to learn sometimes. But I first want to define poetry. What is poetry? What is poetry? Well, I kind of liken poetry to this. I define it as using words to paint a picture. Using words to paint a picture. And I heard this description once of Jesus turning the water into wine. And the phrase was that the water saw the creator and blushed. And I love that, I thought that's so cool. But that's poetic language, of course, to describe a historical event. And within scripture, there are different kinds of poetry. Uh, even in our world today, there's different kinds of poetry with rhythm and rhyme. Does anybody like poetry, by the way? Who here likes poetry? Maybe you've written it, maybe just like reading it. Good, good. And, and gentlemen, by the way, if your wives raise their hands, remember that. They like poetry. Get some good poetry. Read that to them. That's a good idea. Just a little tidbit there for you. Um, I've, I've always loved poetry. I've, I've enjoyed writing it. Um, I'm not a poet by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but I do think it's fun and it's, it's part of life. It's part of life. And this is where those in love have written poetry to the one they're trying to woo and trying to get, you know, oh, your hair is so beautiful and those kinds of things. Uh, some poets, by the way, in history have talked a lot about creation. Look at some of the classic poets. They've talked a lot about creation. It's also used as an expression of or a way to deal with grief, to deal with loss. One of the reasons I actually wrote some poems when I was in, in college was because I was going through a lot of tough times. And it's an outlet for people to be able to deal with the emotions they have. And it's important. But that's a little bit about poetry itself. Now we come to the next one. Poetic literature in the ancient world. Very similar to wisdom literature, Poetic literature was very common in the ancient world. It's very common. It's not something new that's been invented or you know, you know, recently or even in the past thousand years. The Akkadians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians all wrote poetry. They wrote praises and prayers to their false deities. In one example I have written down here, in the third millennium BC, an Akkadian high priestess compiled hymns to the various deities, of course, that they worshiped. So again, it was very common. 
Uh, now these texts do have some similarity to the writings of the Bible, just like the wisdom literature does, which once again reminds us of the historical context in which the Bible was written. Very important to keep that in mind, you know, because that's the way God wrote it. That's the way it did. But we do need to remember that only the poetry and scripture was inspired by God, not other ones, not other ones. Now, what about today? Today we think of poets who wrote centuries and centuries ago. Shakespeare. Anybody ever read Shakespeare? Uh, classical writers. Uh, but what we don't realize is that the poetry that we think of is still around the world today. It's called music. Music is the biggest form of poetry that we have, I believe, in our culture and our world. There's rhyme, there's rhythm, there's you know, a whole bunch of other things that are included with that, and it's a form of poetry. In the ancient world, however, poetry was a very respected way of writing, of singing, and of memorization. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. But that brings us to C, C, poetic literature in scripture. Now we're getting a little bit more specific. Now when I say poetic literature in scripture, what do you think of? Psalms, Psalms, you're absolutely right. While poetry is used throughout the Bible, the largest poetic book is the book of Psalms. So we're gonna actually focus on that. So if you have your Bibles or your cell phones or your tablets, go ahead and click there or turn there. We'll get there in just a few minutes. A Little bit of a background on the book of Psalms. It is the largest poetic book in scripture. It was the prayer and praise book for the Israelites. The Psalms were meant to be sung either by a congregation or by an individual, and some were actually responsive. For example, sometimes the Levitical priest would sing out a verse, then the congregation would respond, and it would go back and forth. The English word that we have, psalms, comes from the Greek psalmos, and that comes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the book of psalms was probably finalized roughly around the time of Ezra. These were written over a 1,000 year period, beginning with Moses. David wrote about half of them, but there's many other writers also with the book of Psalms. So in the early 400s or so BC, it was finalized and set up into five books. Book one is Psalm 1 through 41. Two is 42 through 72. Book three, 73 through 89. Four, 90 through 106. And last five, 107 to 150. Now these five books mimic the five books of Moses, the Torah. And there's actually specific ones like the Psalms of David, and there's other ones too, um, that you'll find within this structure. And there's actually a pattern in there, and you can do some your own study on that too. And each one of the books concludes with the praise to God. The true and living God. So the focus is Yahweh, Jehovah, the true and living God of Israel, the only true and living God. So they focused on him, what he did, and what he will do even. And there's actually various kinds of Psalms too. Now, I don't have all of them up here, but this is just a few of them, just to kind of give you an idea and understanding about this. There's the Royal Psalms. These focus on God as king, and they were often pointing to Jesus. And they were read when a new king was installed on the throne in Israel. Psalm two is one example. The Torah Psalms. These express the beauty and the truth of God's law. Psalm 119, which is also an acrostic in the Hebrew, uh, uh, alphabet. Creation Psalms. These extol God as the creator of the universe. Very important. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 19, verse 1. Imprecatory Psalms. Imprecatory Psalms. These are a little bit harder for us to understand. These call for God to judge the enemies of Israel. Dash their babies to pieces, O Lord. Psalm 139, or 137 rather. We have a hard time with that, but there is a specific context in which these were written. It's not a personal vendetta. This is a call for God to be judge, to keep his word, to vindicate himself. Last, Messianic Psalms. These Psalms point to the Messiah. Now they can be mixed in, of course, with other Psalms, but one specific example is Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Now there are more, but I just wanted to kind of let you know about these styles, these kinds of psalms of poetic literature in the Bible. Now the prophets also had some poetic literature too, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. We also need to remember that the psalms, this poetry was written while Israel was still under the law. Very important to keep in mind. So some of these things are covenant promises that God made to Israel. 
No, while we can, of course, have application, we do need to be careful and be wise about how we interpret some of these psalms and apply it to today, too. Because some of those covenant promises were for the nation of Israel under the law. We need to keep that in mind. So that brings us to our next point. Interpreting poetic literature, of course, in Scripture. That is going to be where we're going to spend most of our time. But I do want to reiterate that poetry is sprinkled throughout the Bible. We can't just think of the book of Psalms, which we should, but there's actually more to it than that. Uh, the prophets prophesied in history, and they often use poetic form to talk to Israel or even other nations, to proclaim judgment, to proclaim blessing upon Israel, again, or others, using poetry. We've talked about historic narrative, but historic narratives give the context to the meaning of biblical poetry, and the poetry gives a rich understanding of that historical narrative. Does that make sense? I want to make sure. Let me read that again. The historic narrative, that is, when it was written in history, gives context to the meaning of the poetry that was written. And vice versa, the poetry gives a more richer understanding to that historical narrative. So when you come to poetic literature, we have to remember a couple things. The poetry we think of is not the poetry written in ancient Israel. It's a little bit different. We think of a certain kind or style or rhythm of poetry. Let me give you an example here. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and? So are you. Oh, thank you so much. You guys are so kind. Oh, you're so nice. Thank you. Very kind. I, I, you guys are sweet, too. You really are. I appreciate that. But we, we think of the rhyme and the rhythm and things like that when it comes to poetry. That's really not the way Hebrew poetry works. The focus is different. So when you're studying poetic literature, the first thing to keep in mind is to ask, what kind of psalm or poetic language is this? Because understanding the psalm or whatever it is you're looking at will help you with the interpretation. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about some of these things here in just a second. But if it's a royal psalm or a messianic psalm, that indicates certain things. Okay, this is going to be talking about a king. This is going to be talking about the Messiah. That's going to be the focus for the immediate context. And then, of course, you find other ways and look at the, the general context of the Bible. How does the New Testament quote this psalm or quote this reference? Those kinds of things will help you in understanding the poetic literature. Uh, we interpret a lament psalm, by the way, differently than we would a thanksgiving psalm. Oh, Lord, thank you for who you are. What you've done is so wonderful. But then we come to the lament. Oh, woe is me. You know, it's very different. It's a very different style, different form. Second, poetry uses figures of speech a lot. And I mean a lot. We'll look at a few things here in just a minute. There is a big thing here. What do I mean when I say figures of speech, by the way? What does that mean? Simile, metaphor, what else? Illusion, yeah, yep. Sometimes one thing is going to stand for something else. A lot of different things can be done. Let's, let's look at an example. You're in the book of Psalms. Turn to Psalm 114. Psalm 114. We'll just read verses 1 through 4. When Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Very interesting. So let me ask you, what's going on here? What is this a reference to? Coming out of Egypt, exactly. Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. They didn't, know, they didn't know the Egyptian language when they went down there. They had to learn it. Judah became a sanctuary. Israel, his dominion. So again, we have potentially this being written during the time where there was, only two, where there was two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But again, there's the sanctuary, the, the dominion of God there. But also, what is, the sea looked and fled. What is that? The Red Sea. The Red Sea. The Jordan turned back. What's that one about? When they crossed the Jordan, remember the Levites. As soon as he touched that water, psh, just like the sea. So this, again, is poetic language talking about a historical event. So that one's a little bit easy. Let's go a little bit, little bit deeper here. Psalm 91, verse 4 in the King James. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Does God have feathers or wings? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Of course not. Of course not. And by the way, if you read verses 1, 2, and 3, 
and the rest of the context, this is about what? What's it talking about? Protection. protection. God's protection. I'm sorry? Probably an angel. Well, it's actually it's talking about God's protection. He shall cover you with under, under his wings with his feathers. You know, what does a mother hen do to protect her babies? Covers them with the feathers. Protects them. And this is the imagery that is being used for God himself to protect his people. To protect his people. Another example. Turn to uh, Psalm 69. Psalm 69. We'll read this first and then I've got a few questions for you. Psalm 69. So turn over just left for a little bit. Just look at verses 1, 2, and 3. This is, of course, the Psalm of David. Save me, O God, from the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire and there's no foothold. I've come into deep waters and a flood overflows me. I am weary with crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Now, with this, is David afraid of water? No. Is, can't he swim? What's going on here? What's the context? What's being, what's being talked about here? Water here is an imagery for the nations, for his enemies. We'll see that again in Isaiah 17 here in just a few minutes. But he's using this picture, this image of water, of course, you're crashing waters and rushing and overflowing, to say, I'm overwhelmed with this situation. This is, this is a very difficult time, Lord. I'm being threatened by these people. Help. I'm waiting on you to help me. I'm waiting on you to help me. So it's just a few examples. Now, another figure of speech in Scripture refers to God's arm, his hand, his eye. We'll see that here in just a little bit. This is called an anthropomorphism. I know it's a big word. And everybody say anthropomorphism. anthropomorphism. Very nice. Very nice. Good job. You say, well, what is that? Well, this is metaphorical language using human terminology to describe something about God's character or his actions. And we'll look at a few examples here in just a moment. But this is really important because if we miss this, then we're going to say that God, who is spirit, has an arm, has an eye, has ears, and that leads you to some big problems. That's, that's what leads you to heresy. That's what Mormonism does. So let's look at a few examples here. You don't have to turn there, but Psalm 136, verse 12, and Jeremiah 32, 21 say this, with a strong or mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God does certain things. Uses that imagery, uses that picture. So again, does God who is spirit have a hand or an arm? No, no, it's not. No, no. Of course, this is a metaphor for what? Strength. strength. His power, his strength, his might. God's going to do this because he is powerful. He's mighty. He has a strong hand and a strong arm, and he's going to fight for you, Israel. This is about his power and his strength to do what he already has done or what he says he will do. Here's another example. Again, these are really important to understand this because there is a lot of cults like Mormonism and others that really twist these scriptures. Not to mention, if we don't understand this, Christians can really get way out of whack when it comes to this. Another example, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Does God have a literal eye? No. And if we're going to be very literalistic, he's only got one, according to this text. Not two, he's only got one, with my eye, just singular eye. So again, we have to be very, very careful about interpreting psalms, about interpreting poetic literature, even in the prophets too. Another part of uh, Hebrew poetry is called parallelism. This is extremely important, parallelism. So one form of parallelism is called hyperbole. Hyperbole. What is hyperbole? What's the intentional exaggeration to make a point? And even Jesus used this in his teachings too. If your hand offends you, do what? Cut it off. If your eye offends you, do what? Cut it out. Is he saying, okay, maim yourself to get into the kingdom? No, no. He's using hyperbole, a figure of speech, to say, you need to deal with sin radically. You really need to take it seriously. Unfortunately, we don't do that so much in our world today. But it's an intentional exaggeration to make a point. And this is just part of poetry, just part of interpreting poetry. Now, I'll talk about parallelism here in just a moment. 
But just as a reminder, so when we come to poetic literature, first, ask yourself, what kind of poetic literature is this? Is this a psalm? What kind of psalm is it? If it's in the prophets, okay, what is really being communicated here? Second, remember, poetic literature uses figures of speech a lot. That's what poetry is, words used to paint a picture. Third, one key aspect to Hebrew poetry is repetition. 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 Rather than rhyme, poetic language used parallelism, which is a form of repetition. Now this was also common in the ancient world and very important for, for teaching and memorization. Because I want to remind us something. In the ancient world, there were not multiple copies of scripture. They didn't exist. The scrolls were at the temple or the tabernacle. Even in the first century when Jesus was there, the scrolls were where? In the synagogues. It was extremely expensive to have a scroll written, copied, and given to someone. It was not cheap, and most people could not afford it. And even some couldn't read. So what, ha what had to be done? Well, you had to go to your Levitical priests, to the rabbis, in order to be taught what the scripture said. So when there's this poetic rhythm and rhyme in Hebrew, it helps people to memorize and remember the word of God. That's one reason why poetry was written in scripture. And I, I wanna remind us of how precious and wonderful it is for us to be able to have a complete Bible in our own language. Some of us have multiple copies. How many have multiple copies of the Bible at home? Be thankful. Be thankful. Not only have men and women died to give us this book in English, but even to this day, there are people who do not have the Word of God in their own language. They really don't. And um, it's heartbreaking. It really is. But it's a gift from God. It is a gift from God. And when people don't have a written copy, guess what? They have to go to a pastor or a Bible study teacher, either whether underground, in a cave, in order to hear what the Bible says, and they have to remember it. And within, the, the, uh, within Judaism, of course, they would do this, and they would be able to remember it because of the, the rhythm and the rhyme and the repetition over and over and over again. So important to understand that because people depended upon their, their leaders to teach them. This is one reason why, particularly in the Old Testament, God says, okay, you priests, you leaders, you're doing this, you're causing my people to sin. Very important because it was up to them to teach the people and to be an example. And of course, the same goes today. Pastors, Bible study teachers, we have a responsibility also to proclaim God's word faithfully and to live a life that is honoring to him, to be a good example to them too. So one reason that scripture was written and sung in poetic form was so people could memorize it easier. Now there are different forms of parallelism used in scripture. I'm gonna describe three. Now these are not the official names for them, but I've just kind of had them all start with C to help us to remember them. Three of them, constructive, contrast or contrastive, and comparison, comparison. So you say, well, what does all that mean? Well, very easy, let's, let's define these terms first. Constructive parallelism builds upon one idea from one line to the next, or it restates it in a different way. That's, that's the easiest way to define this. Now, this can actually be two different poetic forms, but I've kind of combined them together just to make it a little bit easier for us. I'll give you some examples here. Psalm 105, verses one and two. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wondrous works. Do you see the parallelism here? Restating the same idea. Give thanks to him, call upon him, tell others about him, sing to him, give thanks. Sing praises to him, oh, sing to him again. Tell all of his wondrous works, make known his deeds among the peoples. That's parallelism. Another example, I mentioned this earlier, Psalm 19, verses one and two. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day unto day pours forth speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. Again, you see this building upon itself. It's not multiple things being talked about, but it's main, one main thing. You know, there's one main idea here in Psalm 105. What's that? 
Give thanks to God for what he's done. Psalm 19, what is the main idea here in these two verses? I'm sorry? Declaring the glory of God. It tells who God is. God has revealed himself in creation. And specifically, heavens is a word to describe what we call space, where the planets, the moon, the sun, the stars are. And if you've ever seen pictures of space, it is absolutely mind-blowing. It really is. Go online, look up some pictures from Hubble Telescope. Wow. Astounding. Absolutely astounding. Creation tells us something about God. It doesn't tell us everything, but it does tell us something. Now, I looked at, we looked at this verse a little bit earlier, but I want us to look at it again. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Well, look at the parallelism here. Instruct, teach, counsel, all referring to the same idea, the same concept. They're parallel words that are building upon each other to refer to the same thing and giving more details. And this is actually God's response to David's prayer of repentance, if you read in verses 1 through 7. The idea is he's going to direct the one whose heart is pure before him in this context. So that's constructive parallelism, helps us to see these things. And it builds upon itself, repeats itself, explains something, and the goal is to communicate one truth in different ways. That's the idea. One main idea, though it's repeated in different ways. Now we come to contrastive parallelism. <laughs> This is where one line says one thing, the next line contrasts it by saying the opposite. Okay? Let's look at a few examples here. Psalm 73, verse 28. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I am weak, but he is strong. Psalm 40, verse 4. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not... Turn to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. It's a contrast. Is the Lord the one you trust in? Or do you trust in the proud and those who believe in falsehood? It's a good question. For the world, for the church, for us. Also, we did see this in the wisdom literature when we looked at that last time, but it's also related to poetry. Remember this, Psalm 15, or Proverbs 15, verses 1 and 2. The gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. Again, it's a contrast. It's a contrast. And this is where contrastive parallelism really makes us think about what we're reading. So consider these things. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. How important is that in families, with friends, within ministry, within more? The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. Whatever they say, it's just folly. It's useless. It's empty. It's vain. But the tongue of the wise, those individuals who are wise, they, 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 they make sense when they talk. But a fool, he's just a moron. He doesn't say anything, even though he, he may talk a lot, but never say anything. I've met people like that. Sometimes I'm like that. And third, comparison parallelism. Comparison parallelism. This is where something is compared to another. Usually with the words like or as, this is the similes that we were talking about just a few moments ago. Give you a few examples here. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now, I've grown up with cats and dogs and fish and other animals. I've personally never seen a deer pant for water. I've never seen, I don't know if anybody ever seen that. I've never, I don't know what, I've never seen that. Now, David would have. David would have seen it, because of course in the desert and everything. I've seen dogs pant. And you know, when they're thirsty, they pant. Their tongue comes out and they're like, <gasps> you know, they really, really get hot and everything. And that's the point here. That's the point here. As the deer pants, desires, is so thirsty for the water, my soul pants for you, O Lord. My soul desires you. Just as an animal is parched and needs water, I need you. Here's an example from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 17, 12, and 13. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas. Again, this is where the water stuff comes in. And the rumbling nations who rush in unlike the rumbling of many waters. 
The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters. Again, you see, he says the same thing. But he will rebuke them, and they will flee far away and be chased like chaff in the mountains before the wind, or like whirling dust before a gale. Wow. That's a lot of similes in a couple verses. Let's think about this for a second. Exactly. <laughs> he likes poetry, too. For, my, for those who don't know, that's my little son over there. That's my boy. Isaiah here is using figures of speech and parallelism of, the, again, the seas, the waters, to represent this, the nation's rage against Israel and their hatred of God's people. It's also important to realize that Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2 and 15, use this same imagery to refer to the Gentile nations. And then, of course, Isaiah talks about the husks of grain being tossed up and blown away in the wind. Now, if we're, we don't know anything about agriculture, we won't know anything about this. In the ancient world, and even some places, they would take the wheat and things like that, throw it up in the air, the wind would blow away the chaff or the, the husk of that, which is useless. And this whirling dust before a large wind just blows it away. So what's Isaiah here? What's he, say, what's he saying? Well, Lord, you are going to destroy the enemies of Israel, just like the wind blows away chaff. Wow, that's amazing. Because they're coming against us like waters, like the sea raging and billowing to attack us, to destroy us. But Lord, you're going to protect us in the end, in the end. Now, sometimes biblical poetry, biblical imagery is really hard for us to understand because we don't live in an agricultural society, most of us. So who, who here grew up on a farm? Anybody grew up on a farm? Okay, a few of you did. Yeah, a few of you did with the animals and everything like that. But most of us don't live in that society. So it's a little bit alien to us when we say you know, husks and you know, what, chaff. What is all that about? So it requires a little bit of research. It requires a little bit of study. Some still, of course, use that, uh, that same, uh, uh, live in that imagery today. But Jesus used this same kind of imagery when he taught sometimes. Here's an example from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, 47 through 49. Very familiar. <laughs> Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it was well built or was built upon the rock. But, here's the contrast, the one who has heard and is not acted accordingly is like, there's a simile, the, the comparison, or, is like a man who built his house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. So even Jesus used this poetic imagery in his teachings. Because, of course, he was a Jew. He understood Jewish poetry. He understood Hebrew poetry. He would have used the same imagery that they would be familiar with to communicate. So, finishing up. Applying poetic literature. We've done some of, the, some of this already. But a couple things to keep in mind. When it comes to poetry, there's a few things to keep in mind. I do like this quote from How to Read the Bible from All It's Worth. Quote, a musical poem cannot be read the same way as an epistle or a narrative or a section of law. It is intended to appeal to the emotions, to evoke feelings rather than propositional thinking, and to stimulate a response on the part of the individual that goes beyond a mere cognitive understanding of certain facts. This is, or this after all, is the very reason musical poems are so well loved. While Psalms contain and reflect doctrine, they're not intended to be repositories for doctrinal exposition, and that's true. So there is doctrine, of course, in the Psalms and poetic literature. There's truth in these things. However, the writers intentionally try to get the reader or the speaker, depending upon how it was used, to understand something related to that truth through the emotions to our mind. Now, we have to understand in Scripture, there is no disconnect between our emotions and our thinking. It is connected completely. That's something we have done in our society. There's no disconnect in Scripture. Poetry, like wisdom literature, is not meant to be taken literalistically. I talked about that a few moments ago. Remember God's eye, God's arm? Not literalistically. But sometimes poetry does tell us about the character of God. We saw that. His strength. His power. And other times, this poetic literature is in prophetic literature. So it kind of rhymes there. I'll give you a few examples here. In Psalms, 
we're shown that we can be open with God with our emotions. And we should be. To pour out our heart as one would pour out a glass of water on the ground. See, I'm using poetic literature right there. Did you get that? And I think that's really important. That's part of a relationship. We can't draw close to someone if we're not open and honest with them. And we can be open and honest with God in everything and every way, because guess what? He already knows. Amen. He already knows. And the good thing is, He's so gracious and patient with me and with us that we can come to Him with anything, for any reason, at any time, because of Christ. And that is something we can rejoice in. So keep that in mind. Also, when you are studying, look at the whole passage. Don't just take a couple of verses. Look at the entire context. So again, if it's a psalm, look at the entire psalm. If it's in prophetic teachings or the teaching of Christ, look at the immediate and general context. Again, I will come back to this all the time. Look for this main thought of what's being communicated with this poetic imagery. And the way it's being communicated, too. It can be easy. Sometimes it can be hard. Now, we're going to look at one example that may surprise a few folks, but I think it's also very important. It's Psalm 51. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. How many have ever heard this verse before? Very familiar. Unfortunately, and you can, do the, you can do your studies on this, and you find out it's really disturbing. Some in church history have looked at the sexual act as being sinful or shameful. Sex and marriage between one man and one woman is not sin. But, unfortunately, sometimes this has caused a lot of problems early on in church history. Also, too, some use this text to talk about what they, just, they, they define as original sin. Have you ever heard that before, that, that phrase? Yeah, it's a common phrase. But we have to ask, what is actually being said in Psalm 51? What is the context of the entire psalm? What is the psalm? Anyone know? It's a psalm of repentance. David sinned with Bathsheba. Nathan came to him, came to him told him a story and said, you are the man. And David said, oh no, I have sinned. I have sinned. And I mean, you can you know, you know, check it out. Don't take my word for it. Turn over to Psalm 51. <laughs> Verse two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me for I, I, I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. There in verse 4. <laughs> exactly. So that is the context of, of Psalm 51. It's a psalm of repentance. And here David is expressing his repentance in poetic form to God himself. He says, how deep, how far back does my sin go as I look at myself? It goes back to my conception. So in this figure of speech, again, hyperbole, intentional exaggeration, he says, you know what, Lord? I am so sinful, it goes back my entire life, even to before I was born. Now, while again, there is doctrine in the Psalms, it's not intended to be a doctrinal dissertation about sin. He's using poetic language to say, Lord, even when I was conceived, I was sinful. He's crying out to God for himself, looking at his own heart, looking at his own heart. How can we apply this? Well, repentance of our sins should be genuine and heartfelt. We should ask for God's help and for his restoration. Lord, only you can help me. Only you can restore me. Only you can cleanse me. And of course, in Christ, he's done that. Praise him. How should we not apply this? Well, as you continue reading, he says, you know, take not thy spirit from me. Well, we don't have to worry about that. Once we are a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ through faith in him alone, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We cannot be unsealed. We cannot be unadopted by God. We cannot lose the salvation he has given to us. David wanted to restore a healthy relationship with God, which is a wonderful thing for us to learn about too. That's the main meaning and application of this text. And when he talks about, by the way, don't take your spirit from me, he's probably thinking about Saul, whom God withdrew his presence from because of Saul's sin. Another example, we looked at these before, but let's start to do some application here. Psalm 105, 1 and 2. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wondrous works. Do we sing to Him? Very simple question. Do we praise Him? Do we tell others of what He has done? 
And there's actually some double parallels here, which is quite interesting. This make known his deeds among the peoples, that's more than just a local place. That's among the peoples everywhere, just general peoples, which also parallels verse 1, make known his deeds, and or, by, verse 2, by the way, tell of his wondrous works. Are we telling others about what God has done in Christ? Are we sharing the gospel? Are we saying, hey, this is what I learned the other day when I was reading my Bible. Hey, did you hear about this? This is pretty cool. Wow, you, did you realize? Fill in the blank. So we should sing to him. Another one. Again, Psalm 42, 1, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. Do we long to know the Lord more? As a deer or a dog pants for water, do we thirst and desire to drink from his word? Is he the one who we find refreshing from? Is he our sustenance or is it something else or someone else? So in summary, when it comes to applying poetic literature, take it on a text by text basis, that's important to remember, and use these principles we've discussed. I'll go briefly over them once again. Number one, ask yourself what kind of poetic literature is it? Second, remember poetic literature uses figures of speech a lot. Third, remember repetition and parallelism that we talked about. And then fourth, take it as a whole and then apply it. Very important, just very basic principles for interpreting some poetic literature and applying poetic literature. Now as we finish up, it is important to understand something about poetic literature in scripture. Not only does the poetic verse of the Bible touch our emotions, it engages our minds and our imagination too. Think of the imagery that we read about. When Jesus talks about building your house upon the rock or upon the sand. Think about what David and what Isaiah are talking about, about against the, the, the peoples who seem like a, a, a flood or a sea coming against us. Think of that imagery as you're reading these things and use your imagination. Now, some of us understand poetry more easily than others and some struggle, it just depends. But either way, study it, appreciate it. Be thankful for it, understand it, and apply it properly. So as we do finish up today, I have one question. What grips your imagination? We don't talk about imagination very much. But what really grips your imagination? In all honesty, the only thing that will really make us stand and bow in amazement is knowing God based upon His Word. Amen. Only He is magnificent and awesome enough and amazing enough for him to grip our imagination and say, wow, who is this God who spoke and the universe was? Who is this God who freed his people from Egypt? Who is this God who sent his son to die for my sins? To resurrect three days later physically and who is coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords to set up his kingdom? Who is this God that I get to spend eternity with? Who is he? Only He can truly grip our imagination. Does He grip our imagination? I hope so. Now, Lord willing, in a few weeks, next time I'll talk about interpreting prophetic literature in Scripture. Different principles, different things. So please pray for that as I prepare. And uh, with that said, I hope this was a blessing to you and encourages you to think about poetry in Scripture and think about what does it mean, how to apply it, and of course, how to tell other people about it too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you use poetry to communicate so much to us and to your people in the past. Help us, Lord, give us wisdom, give us understanding and insight about interpreting and applying poetic literature properly. We thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for again, everyone who's here. And we do lift up everything that is a burden on our hearts to you. And we thank you that you are there and that you know, that you see, that you hear the cries of your children and that you are with us. So we thank you for all things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth.
Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.